So whether you're walking through difficulty that somebody else has caused or that you've caused yourself, you've got to realize that your faith is going to be tested. You're going to go through some things in life that's going to test your faith to see God knows it's for real or not, but you and I need to have the test for us to determine are we practicing, not only what we preach, are we practicing what we say that we're learning? And so let's look at a few of these. Obviously, the best place to look is in Genesis as we look at the life of Abraham. Point number one is your faith will be tested. Now, it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham... And he said, here am I. Always answer that way when God calls your name. <laughs> Always say, here am I. He said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, gave him real specific instructions there, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I will tell you. God is not a respecter of persons. If he tested Abraham, he will test you and I. That just goes. If you're a Christian, then you will be called to be tested in your faith. We look back at the Bible and think, well, I'm glad God did that to him, but just don't do it to me. No, it will happen. We all go through tests. Many of you in this room have attended UT. Many in this room have attended U of H, but everybody in this room will attend U of F, the University of Faith. And you will take tests in that university, for sure. You see, testing is part of discipline. Testing is part of education. Testing is required for growth. How would you like let's say next week you have to have brain surgery and you go in for your very last uh, appointment with your doctor. Of course, you see all the diplomas on his wall and you say, you know, doc, just before we talk about my brain surgery tomorrow, I'm just interested in your education. I know you've been through all these medical schools and all this training and everything. And, you know, tell me a little bit about medical school. He said, you know, I went to a medical school that didn't give tests. <laughs> it was great. They just, you did the schoolwork and they said, do you know it? And if we said, yes, we do, then we went on. And if we went to the next class and they said, did you learn this? And we said, yes, we did. And then they did. And when we did our practice and our internship on animals and cutting out their brains and doing all that, the, the professor would just simply say, well, you think you got it good enough? And, and if we said yes, then we went on. And though here I am as a brain surgeon. You said, well, here I am, I'm out of here, you know. And you mean you don't want a brain surgeon that hadn't been tested? Shouldn't his own word be enough? No, because if he's going to be used to do that kind of work, he needs to be tested. And if you and I are going to do God's work, we've got to be tested. I used to teach school, and you'd ask the kids, do you know the material? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Well, review the material. You know it. And then you give them a test, and then they fail it. Just saying you know and saying you believe the Bible doesn't seem to be quite enough until you take a test. And when you take the test, you walk through a trial or a difficulty, or God asks you to do something you don't really want to do, then you'll determine if you pass or if you fail. And so this is the case with Abraham. You know, we can see that it benefits us. Job, in, and we know how bad he went through life in 23.10, when he was tried, when he has tried me, when God has tested me, tried me, I shall come forth as gold. God has a reason for it. It's not to send us through difficulty just for difficulty's sake. It's so that we'll come out better than before the trial, difficulty, or temptation whichever the case may be. Now, a lot of people just fuss because of temptation. They fuss because of trials. They fuss because of difficulties. But those are tests just to see if we're going to pass or if we're going to fail to know, am I really following God? Or do I just say that I am? You know, not only is faith going to be tested, but faith does not need an explanation to step out. Only a promise 
We always want God to explain why, why, why. But faith doesn't need a why. Faith only needs a promise. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. I don't know about you, when you think about this, God's asking you to give your only son as an offering and sacrifice to kill your only son? This is, a, this is a big deal here. This is not God asking you to get up early to come to church. This is God asking you to give your only son as a sacrifice. This is a, a big deal here. And what amazes me in all this whole story is there's no hesitation on Abraham's part. There's no why and why me and all this and all this explanation. It's just simply the very next verse is he rose up early and went. Is that how you and I obey God? He tells us to do something and immediately we rise up and do it. That's what he did, no hesitation at all. And obviously he had to sleep on it because he got, uh, got up early that next morning. Can you imagine? I can't imagine him sleeping much that night thinking about what he would have to do to sacrifice his only son. And I don't know if that night and there was obviously some other nights because it took him three days to get there. I don't know if that night and the nights that he traveled, if he didn't just spend nights not sleeping but looking up in the sky. Not only to talk to God but to count those stars because God had already told him, remember when he was 100 and his wife was 90, that you're going to have descendants. He said, count those stars. You're going to have descendants that many. That's his promise. And they were barren, 90 years old for the wife, Sarah, 100 years old for Abraham, and God promised him that look at those stars and count them, that's how many descendants you're going to have. And so I'm wondering if he was looking up those stars one more time that night, not being able to sleep, thinking, God, I don't know how you're going to do that if you had me kill my only son. How's that going to happen? <laughs> you got to have a son to have descendants. And three days, can you imagine? I mean, it, it was like, remember in your elementary school, I didn't mind getting pops that day, but boy, if the sister principal said, you're going to get them tomorrow. Oh gosh, that was no good at all. You know, that just gave you a whole night to think about it. But can you imagine three days walking and walking and thinking about what God has called you to do? Gosh, that had to be hard. I'd, I'd said, Lord, can we do that at least the next morning? Let me get this thing over with. It just, just that stress. And then as he was walking to, you'd think we'd have heard something about the logic. Him telling God, Lord, it's not logical. It's not rational to promise me offspring, to promise me great descendants and kill my only son. It doesn't add up. I don't know about you, but much of what I am asked by God to do doesn't add up. Logical. Give when I need to keep. A lot of what the Bible says doesn't make logical sense. Abraham's probably thinking, man, I'm pushing over 100 now. We can't start over with another one. But he doesn't. You don't see any logical thing going on. And it doesn't say in this story, but I don't think he's told Sarah about this, personally. <laughs> I don't think he went to Sarah and said, here's what God's told me to do. Now, she may, but it, the Bible doesn't record that. wonder why, because she would have probably went up to him and said, have you lost your mind? You're going to do what? We waited till we were 90 and 100 years old to have a baby, and you're going to take it up to the mountain and sacrifice him? Knocked him upside, with, upside the head with a frying pan or something. You know, it's like, you can't do this. And so we see that he proceeds but he had to step out. You know what a lot of Christians would have done right here? I'm going to pray about it. Go pray about it. I don't know how many people I've told something that's directly in the Bible and said, there it is right there, and they're going to say, I'm going to pray about it. Pray about what? I'm just going to pray about it. 
What do you need to pray about? That's where it says it right there. Or, uh, here's a better one. I've already prayed about it and I'm not going to do it. Well, you got the wrong number on your dial-up for prayer because that's not what... The Bible always answers this. This is his answer, you know. Now you may pray about, well, God give me strength and give me stamina. That's okay, but they didn't mean that. They're going to pray if they're going to do it or not. You know, but you'll never and I'll never get the benefit of what God has for me as a result of the obedience if I don't step out and do it. And the longer I think about it, the longer I'll talk myself out of doing it instead of doing it immediately like Abraham did. You know, being a heart patient, my doctor gives me Lipitor to take to lower my cholesterol. And so let's just for sake of simplicity, let's call my doctor Dr. Lipitor since he gives me Lipitor medicine. And he gives me a prescription for Lipitor medicine so that it will benefit my body by lowering my cholesterol. And so Dr. Lipitor gives Pastor Strickland his Lipitor prescription. I can go to the pharmacy and I can attend pharmacy meetings. I can go and talk to the pharmacist. I can go to a Lipitor study at the pharmacy. I can sing at the pharmacy as I praise Lipitor. I can raise my hands and say how great Lipitor is. I can go to the pharmacy and give a donation. I can ask for the pharmacy of, with, of the Lipitor book and I can read about Lipitor. I can memorize pages and verses out of the Lipitor book. I can wear a Lipitor emblem around my neck on a chain, but until I take that pill and put it in my mouth and swallow it, it's not going to do me any good. And people come to church and go back and come to church and go back and I'll say, I don't see what everybody praises the Lord about. Because you've got to not only hear it, but you've got to do it. And Abraham did it. And none of us, I don't believe, have been challenged as much as Abraham to give our only child. But he was, he gave it that way. The third thing is that faith depends on God. Not feelings, not others, not even on ourself. A lot of times we have too much faith in just ourselves. But Abraham didn't. It said, Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there, and we will worship and return to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his Isaac, his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife so that the two of them walked on together. He, he goes on, he tells these people, first of all, we will worship. Do you see what he's saying? First of all, it's amazing to me that he's going to call this worship. Would you call that worship? That you're about to give your only child as a sacrifice and you're going to call it worship? Stay here, men. Me and the boy are going to go up there and worship. You know what's amazing? Isaac didn't say, but daddy, where's the praise band? Where's the instruments? Where's the overhead projector? Where's the sheet music? Do you notice he didn't say that? Because that's only one part of worship. Yeah, we just got through worshiping, and that is some way that we adore and worship God. Don't get me wrong, it is. But worship is total adoration, not only in singing, but in living a life sacrificially to God in praise and adoration to Him. And they're about to go do that. Yes, we can worship the Lord with music, but we worship the Lord all the time, not just in a worship service. We're to worship Him day in and day out. The Bible says that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable worship. So we need to be able to do that in our life. And then you know what He told the men? Stay here. It's just me and the boy. 
Do you feel sometimes that you just are on your own? You may have people help you and pray with you. You may have a church, but sometimes you feel like, you know what, this right here is just going to be between me and God. His wife wasn't there. His friends weren't there. Nobody was there. He even told those guys, you stay here. I've got to go worship God. I've got to make this decision. You know, it said they walked together. I wonder what that conversation was like, walking with your son, knowing that the one next to you is the one you're about to kill. Personally, I just think it was a quiet walk. I couldn't think of anything I could say. It was probably pretty deafening just to be walking that long distance for three days. How in the world could you keep pressing on? You know what I believe our greatest enemy here is? If you and when you and I are called to be tested in our faith, it's not Satan, it's not the world, it's our feelings. Matter of fact, it's Satan using our feelings. I believe is the greatest deterrent that we'll find out when we get to heaven is why didn't I trust God more? It's because we trusted our feelings more. How do you think Abraham felt? You think he said, bless God, I just feel like killing my son that I waited for for 100 years. No. His feelings were just contrary, 110% contrary. His feelings were saying, no, 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 no. And God was saying, yes, yes, yes. But our feelings can trick us. Satan will use your feelings and my feelings to trick us, I believe, more than any other type of trick in his arsenal. It's kind of like going to watch a movie or watching a movie at home. You know, we sit there and we watch that movie and we get all into it. I know I do. I mean, when I'm in there, you know, I'll be hollering at the guy, look out behind you! Don't, don't, don't! That guy's a oh man, he's... You know, I just get all into it like, you know, that guy's going to hit you. If you don't turn around, he's going to stab you. Turn around now. You know, and we just get all in there. We get emotional. We leave the theater. We leave our, our TVs and, and we're just drained emotionally, whether it's from sadness or from fear or from whatever it is. We leave there emotionally drained because what we just watched, our feelings just took over. And if it's a good movie, by a, a producer or director that are probably going to win an Academy Award, their job is to make you and I feel like that's real and that those really aren't actors, but that's real life. I mean, some people, they leave out and say, oh man, poor Bob, and he's going to die next week of cancer, and oh gosh, I'm just so depressed over that. That is a movie! <laughs> that is a show! I can't wait to watch next week to see if Bob really dies because it's really bothering me. See, that director has so got into us that we feel like that's real. That's not a movie, that's real. See, that's what Satan does. He makes our feelings like the movie. It's real, Lord. Yeah, our feelings are real, but we don't respond on that. I don't go away depressed the next day because I saw somebody die on that movie. Why? Because that was an actor dying. That was ketchup. That was something that was red. That really didn't happen. And Abraham did not go by his feelings. He went by faith. And then there was Isaac's analysis. He begins to look around and says, wait, Dad. <laughs> Hold on. We got wood. We got fire. I think we may have a knife. But we're missing something. Where's the lamb? I mean, if we're going to make a sacrifice up here, I think you left something behind at the house. There's no lamb. And boy, his analysis was right. And then we have Abraham finally at the moment of decision. Abraham takes it, he makes the altar. He arranges the wood. He binds up Isaac. He lays him on the altar on top of the wood. And he stretches out his arm with the knife. I don't know about you, but with children, I, was he looking at him eye to eye? Did he turn his head? I don't know. I don't know if I could look him in the eye. You know tears had to be rolling down his face. 
But he knew he had to. And so there he goes. He's about to kill his own son. But you know, even Hebrews tells us a little about this, that Abraham believed that even if he killed him, God had the power to raise him up from the dead. That was his faith. That I don't know what's going to happen here. See, a lot of people say, if I know everything will happen, I'll have faith. No, Abraham didn't know what was going to happen. Either he was going to kill his son and God, he believed God was going to raise him from the dead or something was going to happen. But he carried it through and so he's about to take his own son's life. And then it says, but. Praise God for that one. Don't you like those in your life when God comes through? But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said to him, said, here am I. And he said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. You know what he did? He passed the test. Now I know. He said, didn't God know before? Yes. Now Abraham knows. He passed the test. Now I know I called you to do something and you did it. You did it immediately. You did it completely. And he was pleased because he obeyed God. And this isn't one of those tests that you get an A, B, C, D. You either pass or fail. You either do what God says. You don't do part of what God says and get a C. You either got to do all of what God says or you fail. But praise God, he passed. He not only passed, he found out a lot of part about what this particular test was about. It was about what is more important in your life. Or should I say this, what is most important in your life? And I know everybody answers this. God, I, I know that's the right answer. We've grown up in church, we know the right answer is God. I'm not saying the right answer. I'm saying the real answer. Where does your time, your energy, your thoughts, and your commitment, what is most important? Or is work a greater commitment? Or is family a greater commitment? Not that all those aren't important. Are hobbies a greater commitment? But is God really number one? And he said here, now I know now I know. Now I know that nothing's more important in your life than me. See, that is what every time when we do something in the Bible that we really can't make sense of, logical sense of, or whatever, that's really what we face. And then faith leads us to provision and blessing. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his thorns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him for a burnt offering in place of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. The name of that place was Jehovah Jireh. Matter of fact, we look at that the Lord will provide. The Hebrew is Jehovah Jireh. Jireh is the Hebrew word ra, which literally means see. So the Lord will see to it or provide and he wants to be seen doing it to get the glory. I think that's a neat way to even see that. Yes, the Lord will provide. I like the phrase, the Lord will see to it. You know, if some of my, if my friends tell me, Brother Tim, I'll see to it. I don't worry about it anymore. I don't worry about it anymore. If they tell me I'll see to it, then it's going to be done. And if God says he's going to see to it, it's going to be done. Because he's God, he's Jehovah Jireh, he will see to it, and he wants to be seen doing it. Why? So he can get the glory. See, when you are asked to do a test by God, he wants you to pass the test not only for you, but he wants you to pass the test for his glory. 
of what God would do. A lot of people, they don't praise the Lord because they're not passing the tests or they're not even seeing the test in front of them. So we have to ask ourselves a few questions. Where does God see to it? Where does he provide? At the point of obedience. That's when he's going to see to it. Lord, you're not providing. Well, you had not been to the point of obedience yet. See, it takes obedience first, then you get your blessing, not vice versa. That's where he sees to it at that point. It's for us to move first in the sense of our obedience. See, we want God to move first when he's asked us to do it and then move first. Many of you for me are about the vehicle called a, an Impala. Well, that was named after an African animal called the, uh, the African Impala. That's, that's an animal that can jump 10 feet high and over 30 feet in one leap. That's a jump there. 10 feet high and 30 feet in one leap. So the manufacturer called it a Chevrolet Impala. It was just fast, it was brisk, it was something that people would, would, would recognize. But a Chevrolet, not a Chevrolet, that's the way a Chevrolet Impala can be. An, an African Impala can be kept in a zoo with a three foot fence. That's all they have to build, three foot. He can jump 10 foot high, he can jump 30 foot out, but he's kept in a zoo with a three foot fence. Why? Because biologists have found out one thing, that an African Impala will never jump where he can't see where he lands. There are a lot of Christian Impalas because they say, God, I'm not going to tithe. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do this hard thing. I can't forgive that person. I can't do those things. I can't do it until you, God, show me what's going to happen. Do you promise me till I see it all? Well, you may not see it all. We can't be like that African Paula and say, well, if I can see where I land down there and obey God, then I'll do it. No, we have to do it, and then God will come through. Do you know when, he told Abraham, when God told Abraham where to go? He told him just to the land of Moriah on one of the mountains. He didn't give him the whole facts. He said, you go to the land of Moriah and I'll send you, I'll tell you where to go on one of the mountains. I believe there's a principle there. God's not going to give us all the information. All he had to do was tell him what direction to go. You go Moriah way and we'll take it from there. See, a lot of people are still waiting. God, you hadn't, you hadn't gone Moriah way. It says, you know what? I'm stepping out that direction. The Bible says the word is a lamp unto our feet. That means you've got to take a step to get one more step's illumination. And then when you make that step's illumination, you get one more step's illumination. There are no, it doesn't say the word is a cue beam, spotlight, floodlight. No, it doesn't say that. It's a lamp for one foot of illumination. You know, it took that when I quit my job 19 years ago to come on staff. I didn't have it lined out. I said, you know, what's this here with, you know, I'm, I'm used to a job, you know, retirement and insurance and all these deals. Well, what's that all about? Lord, show me the whole thing. He's not going, he didn't show me all that. He said, you step out. We'll deal with the rest down there. You know, a lot of people, they have the wives say, you know, how am I going to submit and, 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 and follow this man's leading? I just, you know, he... He doesn't know how to pour water out of a boot with the instructions on the hill. I mean, he just doesn't know much. You know, uh, how can I follow him? He doesn't make good decisions. And you have to say, by faith, I'm going to do it because God asked me to do it. And I don't know what it'll work out, but I'm going to do it. To husbands who said, my wife's being mean as a, as a snake to me. She's just mean all the time. She's angry all the time. And I don't want to love her anymore. I don't want to sacrifice anymore. And you just simply say, I'm called to do it and I'm going to keep on doing it. There's youth that says, I don't know what they're going to do to me if I stand up for Christ at school. They're going to, they may, may do this, they may laugh at me. They, don't worry about what they may do. Do it and find out what God's going to do. Amen. You know, there's people that say, I don't know if I can tithe. I don't know if I can give. I don't know if I'll be able to do that. What about my income? What about my bills? What about this? What about that? I don't know if I can trust God. Do it and find out what God does. You have to step out. You have to believe God. I don't know if I can forgive somebody. 
God, what, they may take advantage of me. They may laugh at me. What if I ask for forgiveness and they get mean back? I don't know. Just do it. That's the Nike commercial. Do it. Just do it. We're waiting and we're waiting and we're waiting and we feel like we're waiting on God and God's waiting on us. It doesn't make sense. It does require risk. It does require the unknown. That's what's called faith. But it's not blind faith because everything in this book, nothing's ever been proved one wrong once. Do you know that? That's what I've always told my kids. I said, you know, God has never been proven wrong once. Everybody else has, but not God. Not one time. Not one verse, not one command has anybody ever done and said, you know what, God was wrong. And if they did, they're a liar. He's right 100% of the time. So we're not blindly going, but we're doing what God asked us to do because he's got a great track record. 100%. If you knew you had a stock and you knew the return was 100% and 100% guaranteed, we'd be a fool not to invest. And God's got a greater track record than that. So we know where God sees to it. When does God see to it? On time. You know, God is never late. Let me say that again. God is never late. I don't have a problem with that one. This next statement I have a problem with. He's never early either. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? He's always on time. Listen, but not on my time. He's always on time, but he's not on my time. He's on his time. Because a lot of times I've said, you're late, Lord, but that was my time. He was late according to Strickland's time, but he's still on time, even though there's some things I'm asking him, why is he waiting? But I know it's not my time, it's his time, so I've got to have faith and wait. Now, I could say, well, I guess he didn't answer his promise, but I know he keeps his promise. It's just me. I've got to wait a little longer to get it. And I may have thought, man, I've waited long enough. Well, you've got to wait even longer than that. Sometimes there's not many microwave answers from God. There's a few. A lot of us have been prayed and boom, the next day, boom, that's it. It did it. God came through. And praise God for those moments. But if you're like me, those microwave moments aren't as frequent as the Crock, plot, crock pot slow cooker method. You know, it just seems like that's more of what we live in. But God, we can't just rush. How does God see to it? Whatever is needed. Do you know what was needed? A ram. <laughs> Not only a ram, a ram you could catch. You don't want to be chasing that ram all the way down the mountain. So he provided two things. One ram and a ram caught in the thicket so he could easily be caught. Do you know he didn't send a herd? Did you catch that? Why? Because he doesn't send more than's needed. He sends what's needed. Now, yes, above and beyond all I could think or ask, but God gives me what I need. So if I say, God, you didn't send me more, it isn't more, he sends me what I need. So whatever he, need, he sent me is enough. So he didn't send 15 rams and say, which one I'm going to pick? We got all these leftovers. No, he just sends exactly what was needed and how it was needed. And then we say, to whom does God see to it? To those who trust and obey, no matter the sacrifice. See, it's that last part that gets us. Are you trusting God? And are you obeying God? in every area of your life. Now, a lot of people would say, I'm obeying him in 95% of my life. There's about 5% of some things I just can't be committed to that, Brother Tim. Okay, that means that 5% of your life will be the area Satan will bring you down in. That's fine. If if the United States government says 95% of our borders are secured from the terrorists, where do you think they're coming in? The 5% that's not, that's no big deal. They're fine with 95%. They're okay with 98%. As long as you give them 2% to get through. And that's all Satan needs, just to say, I'm not going to be committed in obedience and sacrifice in every area. Well, then let Satan in that area. Because he's going to find an area. He's going to find the crack in the armor. 
but we don't have to. Why? We've got a God that's going to come through. Yes, we're going to be tested, but that's simply to say, I am going to trust God and believe God and see Him work. Yes, it's always a matter of grace. It's nothing I earn, but He does bless me when I obey Him. It says, Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you. I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens. He repeats that again. As the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. There's going to be victory there too. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Did you catch that? Yes, it's all by grace. Don't get me wrong. But he said, all these blessings you're going to get because, because, in case we missed it the second time, it's because you obeyed, you're going to get all these blessings. They're going to be yours because. And of course, he goes on to say all these blessings. I mean, I'm going to multiply, I'm going to bless you, I'm going to multiply, bless, bless, multiply, multiply. You're going to be glad you did what you did because you're going to be blessed. A lot of people will get to heaven and they say, God, I, I really thought, you know, that there was going to be more blessing. And, you know, the reason will be because there wasn't any more obedience. By faith, obedience. Because that's how Abraham got all this. He, the Lord didn't say, I'm going to just do it. He said, I'm going to do it because. I'm going to do it because of what you did. Yes, it's still grace. Abraham didn't deserve a thing. So it was by grace, but it came through the vehicle of obedience. He drove him that vehicle. He drove him the blessing through the vehicle of obedience. A lot of people say, Brother Tim, I get everything you're talking about. I know I'm not going to be blessed until I sacrificially obey God in every area of my life. However, I just don't have enough faith. I hear you guys preaching and I hear people and I hear my lift leader and I hear all that. And when I get faith like that, then I can do it. Well, Jesus said if you had it just as small as a mustard seed, you could do whatever you want to do. Tell the mountain to be removed, and it would, and that's a mustard seed. If I dropped a mustard seed up here, we'd all have to probably be looking for it to find it. That's how small it is. Just a little bitty tiny thing. We'd all be on our hands and knees looking for that mustard seed that's that small. And you know you got that much. God's given us all a measure of faith. The man was making a business trip. He was a very wealthy man. He owned his own Cessna plane. He told his wife, he said, come on, we're going to fly to Dallas. She said, I'm not getting on that little plane. He said, why? I'm not, that's not safe. Yeah, it's a safe plane. We've got a pilot. It's a Cessna. It's only a four-seater. You know, it's, it's fine. Come on. He said, I ain't getting on that plane. I am too frightened. I'm too scared. I will not go on that plane. I'd worry the whole time something would happen. I'm not flying. So then he booked two tickets on an airline, a 747 and said, I booked us two tickets. Okay, I'll go. I said, wait, I booked two tickets on this 747, and you just say, okay, I said we could go on our own plane, this little Cessna, and you said, no, what happened? She said, my faith grew because the plane grew. <laughs> That's the difference. You've got enough faith, it's just you don't have enough you're not seeing the one you're putting your faith in big. See, I got enough faith, but when I don't have enough, it's because the one I'm putting my faith in, I'm seeing is small. You really can't do this. Or what if this happened? You couldn't get me out of this situation. Abraham said, if I kill him, that's fine too, because God's going to raise him up from the dead. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. He promised me it's going to happen. These promises are true. I know they're going to happen, so I'm going to trust him. And I'm going to do it. I don't care what happens. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care if anybody puts me down. I don't care what it costs me. I'm going to do it because my faith is in a big airplane. It's in a big God. Faith isn't an issue. We focus too much. I see TV telecast. Faith, faith, and faith, faith. It's not our faith. It's our God. My faith may be small, but my God's big. So the, all that, a lot of that movement is just too much on this. It's my God. My faith is just nothing. It's Him. It's putting our faith in him. That's why 
Even when they showed putting the blood on the doorpost, that's why God just had a bush because that's our avenue of putting up the blood is, is just that, that little bush. So, what area do you really need to trust God in? And do what you know and I know we ought to be doing and quit saying, I know it, let's test it. God is already testing us in some other things, saying, here's my word, you are not doing it in this area, do it, step out and see a blessing. Instead, we're going back here where it's safe. Abraham could have took his son and said, I'm staying here where my boy is safe because nothing's going to happen to him here. Isn't that what we, we like? Comfort. We like it where there's no risks. I'm like that too. We're all like that. But when it comes down to faith, we've got to step out. And some may be even here this morning and you hadn't stepped out originally. Do you know that verse said a ram was caught in the thicket by his horns? That means that Abraham and his son, their provision was a ram and a ram with thorns around his head. A picture of Jesus, the ram with the thorns. And then it says this, it was there in place of his son. Do you know when we mentioned the word worship a little while ago, that's the first time in the Bible the word worship is mentioned, is Abraham taking his son up on that hill. And you know the first time love is mentioned in the Bible is in this story. Take that boy whom you love. First time love's ever mentioned in the Bible is here. And when Abraham obeyed God, he had a ram with thorns on his head to take the place of his son. If you've never come to know Christ, this is your opportunity because that is the first mention of substitutionary death. The death of this animal will take the place of your son. Get your son off that altar. Put that ram on their altar and we'll kill him instead of your son. And God knows pretty well because he took us off that altar and he put his son Jesus on that altar and he sacrificed and crucified his only son in place of us. That's the substitutionary death. That's the substitute. See, that's what, it's not going to church, well, that's a good thing. It's not reading your Bible, and that's a good thing. It's not praying, but that's a good thing. It's saying, you know what? God sent his son to take my place on the cross. That should have been me paying my own sins, but in my place. Instead of me, he placed him on there. And by faith, we need to receive him as our Savior. So this morning, the invitation is to all of us. If you've never come to know Christ, that is the invitation. You realize that Christ took your place and by faith, believe that happened and receive him as your Lord and Savior and then follow him in obedience. You say that happened a long time ago. And if you've been a Christian a while, you know those times that you've stepped out in obedience by faith, God blessed you. But is there some area that maybe God's been working on you on to say, you know what, I've got to step out more. I've got to trust God in some areas. I, I don't want to live just back home. I want to go out there where God has blessing for me. And it's going to require me stepping out into the unknown, not being like the African Impala, having to see what's going to happen up there. But to say, you know what, if God says it, that settles it no matter what. God's speaking to all of us like he spoke to Abraham and tested him. What will we do in the test? With every head bowed and every eye closed as you stand to your feet,